What if I told you I read three books by Robin Hobb and three books by Joe Abercrombie this month, and none of them were my book of the month? Well, hello everyone and welcome to my July book roundup. I'm going to share with you short reviews and ratings for the 14 books that I read in July. Now, I read a wide variety of genres, so I will put timestamps in the description below, so if you want to skip a certain genre or skip to a certain genre, you can do so. I have five different categories this month, although the fantasy genre kind of dominated things. Just make sure that you do skip to the end and get my book of the month, because there are very few books I consider must-reads, but I think this is one of them. Let's go ahead and get started with something, I guess it would be horror genre. It's called In Every Generation by Kendari Blake. And it's set in the universe of the Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Of the Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I just gave her a better title. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the Buffyverse. I really love the show, and I've read a few of the novels. I haven't done any of the comic books or anything like that, but I enjoyed this novel. I listened to it as, a, as an audiobook. I don't do that very often, but I'm trying to do more just to knock out the TBR. And I'll put the narrator's name up here because she was truly fantastic, especially at bringing the characters to life. Now, this is a book that's first in a planned trilogy, so it was kind of a disappointing conclusion because the big A story had zero resolution, and the B story and C story were just okay. But overall, I did enjoy this one. I would say, though, that this would be the perfect way to reboot this television show because it's set 20 years after the show, and some of the characters from the show are in there at an age 20 years later, just like the actors, so it could be a really good way to reboot Buffy. But I gave In Every Generation 3.5 out of 5. Next up, science fiction. I just read one work of science fiction, and that was Ender in Exile. This is considered 1.5 of the Ender Quintet. This weekend, I'll drop a review about that, and I'll tell you why that that is totally wrong. And one reason why people don't like this book is I think it was just marketed 100% incorrectly. This is a book that, although technically can be considered a sequel to Ender's Game. A lot of people would be lost if they didn't read the Shadow series. So I'll talk about that in that review. It's a shorter single review for me, but look for that Saturday or Sunday, and I'll give you my full thoughts on this book. But my rating for this book, I did like it, and I gave it a 3 out of 5. Next into some nonfiction, The Art of the Memoir by Mary Carr. Mary Carr is an author of several best-selling memoirs, as well as someone who has taught the art of, of writing a memoir. And this was a really interesting read. I'm a musician by trade, and one of the things that I always never tire of reading about, listening to, hearing about, is various artists talk about their craft whether they are authors, musicians, dancers, even athletes. I just enjoy hearing about the craft and the process that they go through in order to do what they do. So this was a very, very good read, pretty quick read. And one thing I liked about it, in addition to the subject matter, is it gave me some ideas of some memoirs that I think I want to read. I gave Art of the Memoir 3.5 out of 5. All right, into the fantasy genre next. I'm going to start with three by Robin Hobb. I read the second, third, and fourth books of the Rainwild Chronicles, which are Dragon Haven, City of Dragons, Blood of Dragons. To talk about them as a group, first of all, I really liked this series. I know this is considered the least of all of the Realm of the Elderlings, and I'm not going to refute that. I don't think it's as good as Farseal or Live Ship or Tawny Man, but I think it's very good. I, I enjoyed it. It's just when you compare Hobb to herself, you know, this is the lesser of her series. Um, the series as a whole, I gave it a four out of five. So that means I really liked it. To talk about each book, the second book, Dragon Haven, is the one that I think is most universally rated lower. And part of it is it's kind of slow because you have one singular plot thread where we're following the dragons and their keepers up this river, searching for this lost city of the Elderlings. And because of that, I could see how a lot of readers thought it might be dull. But she changes point of view quite a bit, and I love Hobbes writing of character. I love the sense of world building in this book and this series. So I enjoyed it a lot. I gave it a four out of five. The next book in the series, City of Dragons, is undoubtedly 
the most fast-paced Robin Hobb book I've read. Maybe because it was contrasted with Dragon Haven that it seemed that way, but many of the things in this book that she was doing is putting the places, the people in the right places for the finale. So we weren't just following the dragons and their keepers. We were following a lot of different characters all across the six duchies. And that made it very fast paced as she jumped from one storyline to another. I absolutely love this book. This was fantastic. I love the beautiful ending of it. And it set up the finale so, so well. I gave City of Dragons a five out of five. And the last book in the Dragon Wild Chronicles is Blood of Dragons. And I didn't love it as much as, as City of Dragons, but I just love overall what this series did in terms of my view of the world. It did easily the most world building of any of the trilogies. In fact, maybe as much as the previous three trilogies combined. And not just talking about the dragons and the elderlings. We learned a lot about in the last portion of the, the series, like from Live Ship to Rain Wilds, what's gone on politically around the six duchies, and I just thought it was great. I really enjoyed it. I gave Blood of Dragons a 4.5 out of 5. I think it's a great series. If you read Rome of the Elderlings, do not skip it. I've heard people talk about that, and I, I can't imagine having not read these because I, I adore these books. All right, on to some single entries by authors in the fantasy genre, starting with one I read on my Kindle. It was a book by Ryan Cahill, a novella called The Fall. Now, if you're interested in The Fall, you can do what I did. If you sign up for his newsletter, he'll send it to you for free, free ebook. That's my favorite thing in the world is a free ebook. So I, I read The Fall and I really enjoyed it. It's a prequel to his bigger series, which I think has two novels and a novella at this point. If you don't know Cahill, Cahill is one of the most successful self-published authors out there right now. And I can see why. This book was dynamite. I was really impressed most with how vivid I pictured everything. Because that doesn't always happen to a book, with a book for me. I don't always just visualize things very well. But I visualized the four chapters and the different characters in this so, so well. And it just definitely did its job. It made me compelled to go buy the rest of the series. So I'll definitely be reading more of Ryan Cahill. And I gave The Fall a four out of five. So from a very current self-published author to the most classic of authors, I read Unfinished Tales by Tolkien. I took the dust jacket off because the spine looks better with my collection this way. So we got a naked book here. <gasps> naked books. Anyway, Unfinished Tales. This is the fifth kind of extended Tolkien that I've read. I consider Hobbit and Lord of the Rings as kind of the core and everything else is kind of like the extended universe. And of the Silmarillion and the Three Great Tales and this one, this has been my favorite. It has tales of all three, um, all three ages of Middle-earth. It tells of Numenor, it tells of Middle-earth. The Third Age tales, I think some of them could very easily been in the appendices of The Return of the King. I really enjoyed this collection. Now, some of them are very dry because they're historically written, some of them, but some of them are great narratives. I just, I love the diversity of the tales, and I just thoroughly enjoyed Unfinished Tales, and I gave it a solid four out of five. All right, my last entry in the fantasy genre. If it weren't for my book of the month, this would have been my book of the month, and that's The Ember Blade by Chris Wooding. Wow. I was blown away by this book. This is kind of a combination of modern fantasy and classic fantasy. It's written in a modern way. The characters feel very modern. They feel very three-dimensional. A lot of times you don't know what they're going to do because their motivations may not be the right thing or the good thing to do like you would often see in classic fantasy. But you steep that with, there are so many little scenes that Wooding was just very consciously kind of tipping his hat to Tolkien. And it just kind of warms my heart. It was just so delightful to read. The main protagonists were compelling, but he took the time to flesh out a lot of the secondary characters. He didn't shy away from some of the grimmer elements of this book, but it was never graphic or anything like this. When I bought the Ember Blade, I bought it at a Barnes & Noble, and I was at the shelves, and I looked at it, and I picked it up specifically because... I wanted to pick up a standalone in the fantasy genre, which we know there aren't as many of those as big book series. 
And I'm so glad that I was wrong that this is not a standalone. It's the first of a trilogy because I absolutely love this book and I can't wait to see what happens in the next two books in the trilogy. He's done just a great thing as far as the scope of the world, what's going on with all of the different factions, but it's still a very small character tale. And I just love The Ember Blade by Chris Wooding, an easy five out of five. All right, and the other book series that I read in the fantasy genre this month was The Shattered Sea Trilogy by Joe Abercrombie. Now, this is kind of his forgotten trilogy because it's not set in the world of the first law, so people skip it. Or they hear that it's YA, so they skip it. I don't know why anyone should skip this. Now, much like Rain Wilds, I think when you compare this to everything, I've, everything else I've read by Joe... Yes, it pales in comparison, but there's still enough there that makes it really, really good. I mean, subpar Joe Abercrombie is still better than like 90% of the author's best works out there. So the series as a whole, I gave it four out of five. The biggest thing that's a departure for most of this is it's kind of plot-driven fantasy, which we know Joe doesn't do that. I mean, if you read the first book of The First Law, tell me what the plot is, because I don't know if I could tell you, because it's really all about characters. And the characters in the first Law universe usually inform the plot. Maybe a little less so in the standalones, but in the series for sure. This is plot-based fantasy. It's very, very fast-paced. I read these three books in probably the time it would take me to read one book in the first Law. And that's just a different thing for Joe. Um, the style of storytelling was interesting through the trilogy. So as we started out, the first book's called Half a King. And we have one character named Yarvi, who is a prince, and he's betrayed, and he's left for dead, and enslaved, and goes through all these trials and tribulations, just trying to get back what is rightfully his. And much like any Joe Abercrombie book, even if it's plot-based, we get some really great characters. Not just Yarvi, but some really colorful secondary characters that will stick in your mind for quite some time. And I enjoyed Half a King tremendously. I gave it a four out of five. Now, the second book, Half the World... He kind of changes things up on you. Instead of having it Yarvi's story, Yarvi is still omnipresent in this story and in the trilogy. He gives you two new protagonists, Thorn and Brand, both of whom were fantastic. Thorn in particular, I think, stands up with some of my favorite characters that Abercrombie created in the first Law world. So I loved Half the World. It went a very different direction. Yarvi's still there, but it's kind of Thorn and Brand's story. And I just really enjoyed it. Even more great characters. Still plot-based, but still a great story. I gave Half the World a 5 out of 5. I love this book. Now, Half a War, I will say I was disappointed. Part of it might be personal. But he gives you three protagonists in this book. And the problem with me is I didn't like two of the three of them. One, I felt just so boring. Every time they were on the page, I just wanted to go somewhere else. And the other one eventually had a really good character arc, but for half the book, it was just kind of, I could care less about this character. So that detracted from half a war for me, but it was still a pretty riveting, fast-paced narrative. The ending was absolutely fantastic. He brings it back together, this plot-based trilogy, and you realize maybe it was a character study all along, but it's really, really great. If you're an Abercrombie fan, do not skip... Shattered Sea Trilogy. Oh, I gave Half a War 3.5 out of 5. The whole series, 4 out of 5. All right, on to a classic by John Steinbeck, Sweet Thursday. I'm so glad I read this this month. This is, in many ways, a sequel to Cannery Row. The one thing I say about Cannery Row is that it probably has the most colorful characters that Steinbeck ever created. Additionally, it's one of the most underrated works of Steinbeck's because I think it's as good as maybe everything not East of Eden. <laughs> but Cannery Row is fantastic, and this is a kind of sequel. We get some of the characters from Cannery Row that are back. We get some new ones. Very, very colorful. It's just one of those narratives that I just enjoyed reading. You know, I just smiled a lot and enjoyed this story that Steinbeck put together for us. And I gave Sweet Thursday a 5 out of 5. I'd say if you if you like Steinbeck and you've read East of Eden and Grapes of Wrath, pick up Cannery Row and Sweet Thursday next. It may turn out to be, you may be as delighted as I did having read those. 
All right, finally, what's my book of the month that could top The Ember Blade and Joe Abercrombie and Robin Hobb? Well, it's To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. This was a reread re -read from ninth grade English, and I liked it back then, but I was just blown away by how powerful this little book is. I mean, it's shy of 300 pages. I remember as a ninth grader, I didn't like Scout. Probably as, you know, 14-year-old boy, this annoying little girl, she just seemed like that to me. But I thought she was delightful this time around. I loved her spirit. And what I love most was seeing her growth through all of the things that go on through that throughout this story. I think about this character and I think about how the things that she saw and the things that she went through in To Kill a Mockingbird likely shaped her as an adult. And I wish we would have seen that, seen her as an adult, but I can kind of wonder. But if there's, you know, one, I hate to just say one, but if there's one classic I think you should read, this might be the one. I was really just blown away by To Kill a Mockingbird. Easy five out of five and my book of the month. All right, so I went through kind of quickly, 14 books. I didn't want to take too long in this video, but if you want to talk about any of these books, I'd love to talk about these books with you. Just drop me a comment below, and if you want to talk spoilers, just label your comment that way. I'd love to talk to you about any of these 14 books, what you thought, whether you agreed with me, whether you disagreed. I just love the conversations in the comment section. If you like this video, please give me a like and subscribe. Also, I'd love to interact with you on Twitter and Goodreads. I have my information down here. So find me there. I'd love to talk with you about books in those places as well. As always, thank you for watching. Until next time, goodbye.